What is going on Diablo 2 fans, Dobrinsky here. In today's video, I'm gonna be covering the Diablo 4 2020 quarterly update, and this is a big one covering itemization. They even reference trying to kind of be somewhere between Diablo 2 and Diablo 3, so it's really cool that they referenced D2, because obviously if you are a fan of this channel, you do know that I make a lot of Diablo 2 content, but we're gonna cover today's blog post, give you guys my two cents on all of the different topics. So hopefully you guys enjoy this video, and a quick reminder for those that don't know, I do stream twice a week on Twitch, so if you guys enjoy my YouTube content, maybe hit me up with a follow on that platform. Link is, of course, in the description below. Any follows would be very much appreciated. But guys, hope you enjoy this video. Let's jump in. So right at the start of this blog post, there is three kind of key ideals that they're trying to keep in touch with through itemization in general for Diablo 4. The first is that they want to strengthen class identity by providing intuitive fantasy hooks. Items and skills that lean into the fantasy of your class are the best. So I think like sorcerer spells, casting, you know, Blizzard with sorcerer's orbs for magic spells, that kind of thing, keeping with the Diablo lore. I don't really care too much about it, but I mean, obviously you need to kind of follow it to a certain extent. Like you don't want to have like a casting wand, like a magical wand for a barbarian that's kind of like melee. So, I mean, that's kind of like somewhat obvious of trying to stick with that, like kind of fantasy of items for each specific class in Diablo, but it's cool that they want to try and stick heavily with the Diablo lore. The second point here that they mention is that they want to support deeper customization through itemization, but items should support and enhance your class, not define it specifically. So trying to find that really nice balance of investing your skills in the passive tree or the node for Diablo 4, in combination with correct item use to make your character whole. It's not just entirely dependent on items or entirely dependent on your choice of skills. Just trying to find that really good balance. That's something that I think Diablo 2 does pretty well. Diablo 2, I would say, is a little bit more geared towards itemization because you can have like horrible skill choice with really good items. So you're still okay, but horrible items, just complete garbage items with the correct skill choices won't really make a functional build. So it is tailored a little bit more towards items in Diablo 2. So hopefully we get that in Diablo 4. And the third and final point here is they mentioned that they're trying to shoot for an overall depth of something between Diablo 2 and Diablo 3 with years of things to discover and countless ways to build a class. So replayability, that's really good for the genre. And the fact that they mentioned Diablo 2, I think that's good news for Diablo 2 fans looking forward to D4. I mean, if they can pull a lot of the best things from Diablo 2, I think we're going to end up with a really good D4. The next little subsection here, they talk about the skill tree. Now, this is something that they mentioned in the last quarterly blog post, and I did make a video on that one. But I just want to get this off my chest here that the Diablo 4 skill tree does not have to be like PoE to be successful. Diablo 2, for example, you have 30 skills per character class. Diablo 4 is going to have more of that. There's the passive nodes, there's the active skills, there's the class specific mechanics like the arsenal system for the barbarian the enchantment system for the sorceress that in itself is way more customization than diablo 2 and they mentioned here that based on some feedback they've made some changes like kind of clustering specific nodes together so that you don't have to go all the way across the tree for your different builds so maybe like offensive caster base are going to be kind of more clustered together defensive caster base, that kind of thing. So if they're going to add some even more skills than what we saw previously, I think there's going to be a lot of customization, especially with what we've been seeing for the items. That's just going to add even another depth to building your character. But the next point here that they talk about is respecking, and they're trying to find that kind of balance between not being able to just freely respec, but also allowing players to experiment with different builds. So they talk about how as your character grows, it's going to require more cost and effort to respec and change your build. So I like this personally. You can kind of play around with different directions of characters as you're developing. And then once you kind of, you know, early to, you know, mid character development, once you kind of like lock into a specific build that you like to, focusing all your efforts into that. I mean, at that point, it should make sense that if you continue to play that well into the late end game, that it's going to cost you more to respec and change it. So I think that's actually pretty well balanced in my opinion so yeah i like that they've listened to some feedback added some more depth to the skill tree but it doesn't have to be like poe to be successful and the respecking system is very good as well there's some people that really like that kind of idea of being forced to make difficult decisions you know not a lot of repercussions I'm not going to name names of people that have those viewpoints but i kind of don't want it to be quite as brutal as diablo 2 like i mean having 
you know, three respecs and then having to farm tokens to respec. I'd like to see something where you can kind of play around with different builds through the development of your character a little bit more freely. And once you lock in, it costing you a little bit more to respec. So the next subsection here is primary stats. Now, this is basically similar to attribute points investment in Diablo 2. So there's going to be strength, intelligence, dexterity, or willpower, kind of similar to strength, dexterity, energy, and vitality in Diablo 2. But as you continue to grow levels, you get more of these points that you can invest. Now, depending on your character class, it's going to tailor the investment of these a little bit. So Sorceress is probably going to be more willpower. Barbarian might be a lot more strength for more damage. Druid could potentially be a hybrid of both, depending on if you go pure shapeshifting or pure elemental, or maybe a hybrid. It's going to, again, kind of depend on your character class and sort of the direction you want to take. But this is where things get a little bit interesting. They talk about how there's going to be specific thresholds that as you reach a certain amount of these points invested, it's going to add additional uh, attributes to skills in your skill tree. So taking some of the feedback that people gave about the skill tree in the previous blog post not being complicated enough. Again, it doesn't need to be a PoE skill tree to be successful, but they have a couple examples here. Like if you reach specific dexterity and strength thresholds with the Barbarian, it's going to change or add additional stats to Whirlwind. Same thing here with willpower increasing like the Ice Blade's damage or number of frozen targets, whatever. As you reach these thresholds, they're going to add additional attributes gained or whatever on specific nodes. So I think this is a cool way, again, of adding a little bit more in-depth customization through just investment of stat points instead of just having a million different passive nodes to choose from like you do in Path of Exile. The next section of this blog post is talking about different weapon types. Now, a lot of this really feels like Diablo 2 to me, but right at the start here, they're just showing an example of this barbarian skill upheaval. I mean, this is a gift, not like the greatest quality, but they're just trying to exemplify He's striking into the ground here and then dragging it across and throwing it on the monsters for damage. Kind of, they're trying to pay a lot of attention to detail in the skill animations and the attack animations, so that's really cool. Now they talk about how different specific items, like if they're one-handed or two-handed, like they attack quicker, might not be as much damage, but they attack quicker versus a two-handed weapon, a lot more damage, attacking slower. So this is similar to Diablo 2, so if you compare like a Saber and a Bardiche and Normal, it's the same idea, there's pros and cons to using both, so... It's cool to see that. Now, this is an example, another GIF here, of two different weapon types on the Sorceress, one being more damage, one attacking quicker. So the Staff versus a Wand. This is interesting because this is not a thing in Diablo 2, at least, or your cast rate breakpoints, they're determined solely by just your FCR breakpoints. Now, it's weapons are kind of the opposite. There's a combination of, you know, your attack speed, different support auras, and the weapon base that you're using. That all dictates your increased attack speed breakpoints. So it's kind of cool that different weapon bases on a sorceress that's going to play a factor in Diablo 4. And the bottom here, they're just talking about again, kind of polish how these item icons, how they they're putting attention to detail into the design of them. They do look really nice. The next section to talk about here is item qualities. Now this is really exciting for me. I have mentioned this in previous videos and Diablo 4 installments that I've actually watched a lot of other creators that aren't really maybe super familiar with Diablo 2 talk about this in the previous blog post and they were kind of confused. Sort of the idea of progression of going from magic items to rare to legendary, etc. They're like, yeah, they should just be better. Why would magic be better than rare? That doesn't make any sense. They're taking this from Diablo 2 100%. I just know it. they're talking about how specific affixes can potentially roll higher on magic than they do in rare, but rare can roll more, legendary can roll more, etc. And this is exactly like Diablo 2, I've used this reference before and I'm going to say it again. Druid Pelts, you could potentially get 6 to Tornado on a Magic Helmet. You can get 5 to Tornado on a Rare Helmet and then it goes down less like Jalal's Unique. Now, progressively as you make your way from that Magic to the Rare to the Unique, you will get better overall kind of stats and attributes for your character. But if you want to specifically focus on one particular affix, like trying to boost your damage, that could potentially roll higher on magic. So the idea here is just super late game, in-depth uh, customization of items. You could potentially make up for the lack of affixes on a sorcerer's weapon with other really good gear, but then maybe you have a staff that has like the highest possible, you know, plus six to 
ice blades or some specific spell so you're maximizing your damage by using that magic wand and then you're making up for it with the rest of your gear on your character elsewhere so that's something that you do see in Diablo 2 kind of like your in-depth uh, customization so I'm really really excited to see this and I think that they emphasize that point here with this statement that they don't want to end up in a place where the right decision is to ignore every single item that doesn't have a glowing orange sky beam so ignoring everything that's not a legendary and up like that's not really always going to be the right decision they did say here that the blue magic items are good rares will typically in most cases be better and then legendaries be better than rares but there is the potential for a specific affix to roll higher on magic so i just think that's really cool and the last point here to mention is that they talk about legendary affixes will now randomly roll on legendary items and then unique items will replace mythics so just an example here they have this snaff here that's magic and rare and then legendary and then the actual resource re regeneration excuse me is highest on the magic and then it's six and it's five so it might seem like a foreign concept but for me that's actually very exciting for kind of late in-depth uh, end game uh, item theory crafting so the next section here is talking about legendary affixes and how these Items are going to be basically rare items with one affix replaced with a legendary effect, which is going to be random. They have a couple different examples here. Uh, many can be used by any class, while some will be specific to a particular class. But the fact that they're all going to be unique is really cool for build diversity. Now, they don't really mention here anything about how often these will drop, what the kind of rarity of some of these particular legendary affixes will be so it's kind of all up in the air at this point but the fact that they mentioned earlier in this blog post that it's going to be similar to Diablo 2 makes me think that they will have kind of appropriate rarity which is pretty cool and just click on here just to show you guys a couple examples so they have you know boots here when you stand inside your own damaging ground effects you increase the damage they deal by 27 percent another example when you stand inside your own damaging ground effects you increase the damage deals by 26 percent so this is the exact same example here but this is on the body armor and a boot. So again, they can kind of roll whatever. And here's just a third example. Your chill effects will trigger freeze 25% faster, but you deal 30% less frost damage. So just a variety of different uh, legendary affixes on these items. So I think it's really cool that they're all going to be random. They're not kind of like specific set uniques. Again, we don't really know kind of the rarity of what they're going to roll, how common they will be, but I think it's going to be cool for overall build diversity in Diablo 4. So the last section here they talk about is unique items. They're going to be making a comeback in Diablo 4. I always liked unique items in Diablo 2, even Diablo 1, but the whole kind of like lore behind them. So if we go all the way back to Diablo 1. Remember there's Shaco. Shaco made its way into Diablo 2. I like that they're going to be bringing that into Diablo 4. Now they mentioned here about the idea about mythic items. They don't want to create an item quality that invalidates others. So they're out for now. So that makes me kind of think that these unique items in Diablo 4, while they will be kind of lore and specific sad items, that they're not going to be more powerful than legendaries. It's just a way of kind of adding, you know, your very lore based, you know, specific set item rules just to throw that into the customization for all your different characters in Diablo 4. Well guys, there you have it. That wraps up today's video on the latest Diablo 4 quarterly update. Some very exciting stuff. Feel free to let me know in the comment section below if you guys agreed with what I said, if you think I rambled on way too much, if I'm totally off topic, if you don't like Diablo 4 and the direction it's taking at all, just let me know in the comment section below. I do read all of the comments as always, but I definitely think that they're taking everybody's feedback and it's going to wind up in us having a really, really fantastic Diablo 4. Yeah, let me know if you disagree. And as always, if you guys could throw a like on this video, share it, and even consider subscribing if you're new to my channel. I post new weekly content and I do stream twice a week on Twitch. So a follow on Twitch and a sub on YouTube would be amazing. Other than that, guys, hope you have a fan frickin' tastic day, and I'll catch you on my next video or live stream. Peace out.